We're rolling. Dr. Mike Vecchio, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background in euphonium? Sure. So I started playing euphonium when I was in sixth grade. I started on percussion and piano, kind of. I started taking private piano lessons, and my elementary school band director said, well, we have too many percussionists and we need you to play a real instrument. <laughs> so he had me try out all the brass and the baritone horn, quote unquote, fit the best. Um, so I started taking that in sixth grade. My Luckily, my middle school band director was a euphonium player. Cool. Uh, which helped a lot. Marv Arnold, great guy. And he basically gave me private euphonium lessons every like study hall that I had. Okay. that first year and yeah i just kind of took off with it and i didn't really think about majoring in music until high school and then i started taking actual private lessons um my sophomore year i think it was my sophomore year of high school with a tuba player so that's mm -hmm. a pretty typical route i guess um but he played euphonium quite well and i learned a little bit more about like the sound concept I'm not a trombone, I'm not a tuba, I'm something else. And yeah. then audition for <laughs> um, undergrad programs. I was going to audition on piano, and then I looked at the audition requirements. And euphonium was two contrasting etudes, and that sounded way better. Yeah. So <laughs> I went that route. So I got a bachelor's in music ed and euphonium performance, kind of this combined thing from Ithaca College. Who did you study with? I studied with Dave Unland while I was there. Cool. Yeah. The pre, uh, pre Tyndall days. Wow. It was like uh, soon after that. Um, but yeah, then I fell in love with it. I saw myself as a performer. I wanted to go reach the highest echelons of performing and, Damn. you know, did um, uh, military band auditions from like junior year of undergrad on. Dang. Um, never really did great but you know it's more of the experience it's a, it's i guess stiff competition um, though so yeah for sure and then i taught for two years elementary band and general music and everything after that um after my bachelor's in new york 45 minutes northwest of new york city cool. but i was still driven to perform quite a bit i was still practicing every day um, i was living by myself like would get to school an hour and a half early warm up for an hour and then teach all day and then stay three hours after school and just play, play, play and made friends Dang. with the janitors. And uh, Ralph would give me meatloaf just about every night. It was awesome. And then wow. auditioned for performance um, programs for my master's degree and ended up going to Michigan and study with Fritz Kenzig. So I did a master's in uh, euphonium performance with him and just kind of simultaneously did a master's in music ed while I was there too. <laughs> Casually. So it just seemed right i don't know <laughs> it's kind of got me down the music ed route which is where i am now as a uh, faculty here at illinois in the music yeah. education area so i don't know euphonium has always been part of like my identity i can't never not play yeah. you know yeah. it's like it just makes sense and That's it's funny. i don't know it just it means beautiful sound like yeah are you still playing with chicago brass band not currently i did for for quite a bit so after my master's moved to chicago played with chicago brass band Played with North Shore Concert Band. Um, oh, awesome. Played, I played with this like bluegrass group. That's sick. That, whatever. They're like, hey, our bass player's out. Can you sub? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure. What was that like? Uh, different, really different. Um, a lot of like, here's a, a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy, and like a really faint PDF to read on your iPad. And also, we changed the form. Also, it's a trumpet part. So it's not in concert pitch and you're playing the bass line. Good luck. So I don't know, you know, it's like you gotta do it and do what sounds good. Yeah. And please the, the folks that are there for live music, you know, that are there for like, you know, whatever. Did you like just the, improvise the bass line? Basically. I mean, as much as you could within the styles, yeah. but yeah, it's fun. That's awesome. You know? Yeah. It's like, a good time. Yeah, that's a really unique avenue to pursue with euphonium. I don't know anybody that plays bluegrass music. Yeah, I mean it's different. Like especially yeah. like the the slaps on two and four kind of thing. Like I couldn't really 
do that except yeah. like i guess my wedding ring i kind of like smash the side of the horn a little bit do a little click you know yeah but yeah it's it's kind of weird it's not really idiomatic or yeah the only other thing i could think is like if you gave like a really loud choked release on a note and that might sound a little funky but like you could yeah. kind of do it like accent a release or something like do what do yeah wah. yeah yeah but it's hard because it's like pedals all the time to make it sound right yeah <laughs> you'd have to have a ton of control that's really interesting i've never tried yeah. something like that I, I maybe i should that's weird yeah it is weird really? but like not something the instrument the instrument isn't capable of just something we're not really asked to do yeah and like I, it true. strikes me that like ha- if more euphonium players had a jazz background we might be able to do some of that kind of stuff a little easier for sure yeah i mean that's that's the funny thing like i played euphonium in like middle school jazz band a little bit in high school yeah. jazz band you know but like never really learned how to improvise yeah truly until i just i think my master's degree i took a actual jazz improv course mm-hmm. and i played euphonium for that so that helped quite a bit but yeah it's just it's it's bizarre because you want to make it as like relatable as you can and people you show up to a bar and people are like what is that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know that instrument so. yeah it's really funny especially like because i play with the improvisers exchange here like trying to like work inside of an ensemble that might be like a dozen really delicate timbres yeah is like sometimes it's impossible yeah, <laughs> yeah. do you feel like it's like a uh like a wet blanket sometimes occasionally <laughs> that what i found is i like if i'm going to contribute to the texture i have to make up extended techniques mm-hmm. so whether i'm like whistling into the horn and wiggling my valves or doing air effects or using like the bell as like a really delicate drum and i get next to a dynamic mic so that that actually carries into the room because yeah. they mic so many members of the ensemble yeah so like doing something like that usually yeah. makes a big difference so you almost have to pretend like hide the fact that it's a it's a euphonium <laughs> i would say i have to use like the instrument in ways i never imagined mm-hmm. is maddie barber a player you've heard of I've they're heard based out him, in yeah. california um like really barber. experimental euphonium player but so they um use like a, a bass clarinet mouthpiece in a like a tenor tuba mouthpiece yeah. in the euphonium and like basically have like uh a not quite contrabass clarinet like an right it's really cool and you only get the fundamentals but like for drone based improvisations it's awesome yeah (laughs) so i've been experimenting with that some this semester and Hmm. just trying to embrace the idea that like okay i can be a baritone tenor soloist sometimes i can be a counter melodic figure sometimes i can like really drive the momentum with the percussionist as like a rhythmic kind of brass player yeah like play a line that kind of jams or like run a bass line or play a melody like uh, yeah. trying to like be able to pick from all of the different tools that like, the euphonium can do and like okay how do we contribute to the texture in this way right. and sometimes uh, well and i'll play drones on it too because like with improvised music it's just it's so effective yeah. sometimes just like okay we're gonna lay down this kind of like thin texture for things to happen over right but uh one of the things i've learned about improvisation specifically is like knowing when to not play <laughs> Because I found so many people just like to be like, oh, we're an improvised ensemble. Let's just play all the time. And that yeah. doesn't really work. Right. It's like, listen to my creativity now and forever. But yeah, letting, giving space so it can breathe. Mm-hmm. Or uh, I guess like the, the larger structure, right? Yeah. So you can like scaffold it in a way that makes sense to the listener, maybe. If that's yeah. Cool. But yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's, it's tricky with euphonium in different contexts because... It's like, oh, man, just give me, like, a lyrical, Mm -hmm. beautiful, like, vocal thing. And, wow, I'll show you the full capacity of this. But it's like, well, that's not possible most of the time, right? And, like, based in a bluegrass band or, like, you know, if you're trying to do air effects or there's, like, you know. One time I did, um, I think it was my sophomore year of undergrad, I did a recital with a violinist. And my roommate did a piece. He was a composition major, and he wrote a piece for euphonium and violin but it was like a nightmare absolute nightmare to like fit it together and have me not just completely demolish yeah. everything you know um and at that point i was like 19 yeah. and i didn't know how to 
control. Yeah, the difficulty for me with handling something like that is like, okay, how can I score the euphonium in a range where it's primarily not as vibrant a sound, which isn't very much, right. or do I mute it most of the piece and then also write the violin in a register where it carries like crazy in yeah. order for this to be effective? Yeah. I don't know that enough people think about the, that, the nitty gritty of stuff like that mm -hmm. when they come to work on a piece. Yeah. And I think that can be kind of a problem or have enough space in the parts where they're like filling in where other people might have sustains or rest. Right. So you have yeah. opportunity to get out of the way. Yeah, because it's a powerful voice. It can fill a, a big void. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seriously. In whatever context, you know, with a concert band or even orchestra. We can, we yeah. can do a lot, you know? So I think, yeah, making sure, I don't know, the, the way that parts are written, especially I feel like in marches, mm -hmm. it's like utilize the best you know yeah i have like kind of a hot way. take i don't remember if i mentioned this to you when i asked you to sit for the interview but um i've been asking everybody including hiram diaz what he thinks the most performed piece of band music is because my what i've surmised from the composers that i've spoken to the euphonium players that i've spoken to the orchestration textbooks i've looked at is that um composers coming from uh, an orchestral tradition or learning in an orchestral tradition or coming to band music and saying like, oh, I'm going to write something band. And they don't go study band music or like the classics of the band repertoire. They study like a couple of pieces that are being sold a lot right now or a couple of big pieces by composers who people buy a lot from and then just try to write like that or do something a little different than what those people are doing, mm -hmm. which is – in my opinion, not really making anything new. It's just making more of the same rather than studying the traditions and saying like, okay, how do I like use the traditions to my advantage and make something with my own voice? Yeah. And so all of this is to say, what do you think the most performed piece of band literature is? Man, oh man, that's quite the question. <sighs> like all I mean genres of all time. Goodness I gracious. think there. I think I have a really good guess, even though I'm not sure. I feel like if I'm going at this like analytically, and like put my like music ed researcher hat on, <laughs> I think like there's got to be a quantitative study of this mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, I would imagine it'd be like a some sort of like either a whole suite, mm -hmm. maybe second suite, or like a young band march. I think it's the Stars and Stripes Forever. Mm. Okay, why? Because it, if nothing else, it closes every military ceremony and military band concert. Oh, uh, well. Every year, and probably most 4th of July concerts. Yeah, I was just thinking like school band. Okay, <laughs> but, yeah. like, but, but like a school, a, a good school could play Stars and Stripes, and yeah. that just adds to the sure. quantity of plays that it gets. But it's I think... Tricky. But I think if we're if we're going to look at probably like the most performed piece, I think that's a good guess. I mean, even if it's not true, I think it's a really good guess. <laughs> I would say it's it's the most common euphonium excerpt by a landslide, <laughs> which actually brings up a really interesting question of like if you're going to write a piece for band, especially if you've never written a piece for band before, <laughs> shouldn't you study the stars and stripes forever? That there's something to that. I think, yeah. I think so. If nothing else from look just looking at a short piece like that, I mean, yeah. it's what, three and a half minutes? It's really brief, but you you learn what the band is capable of out, with all of the instruments that are outside the typical orchestral canon. And then all of your orchestral and chamber music pedagogy then That's feeds true. into... Because like, okay, yeah, if you study the Stars and Stripes forever, are, are you going to learn a great deal about writing for French horn? No, but if you're coming from an orchestral pedagogy, you don't need to learn more about writing for French horn because you've learned right. a ton about it already. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's true. That would make sense. Just throw stars and stripes at them and say... Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> even... even I think the I think at least the whole first suite in E-flat, if not the second suite enough, and then Link Charposi are really great takes, too. If nothing else, then just, like, here's how, like, 
Or I think the Vaughn Williams folk song suite is a good choice too, because if nothing else, of just saying like, okay, like these are irrefutable members of the orchestral canon, and look how well they handled the wind ensemble. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very true. I think I don't know. I have um, baggage or beef or whatever you want to call it, beef in my baggage about the, <laughs> the way that euphonium parts are. Um, written in like young band works yeah and <laughs> I, I, I did you start on euphonium yes i didn't want to i like you wanted to play percussion and then <laughs> my director said we have too many and yeah. so i said then give me a tuba that's what i want to do and he said i don't think you're big enough Interesting. <laughs> and yeah. i said well that's stupid and he goes <laughs> Well, why don't you try this euphonium thing, and then uh, if you decide like you don't want it after a little while, we can talk about you switching to tuba. And I was like, okay. And then he handed me Brian Meixner's CD Genesis, and I was like, what's this? And he goes, that boy went to your grade school. (laughs) And I was like, okay. (laughs) And I just listened to it a lot. You're like, great. Yeah. It's like, oh, cool. So I like... I, put, I went home, I turned it on, I like heard the Ellerbe concerto for the first time, and I was like, this is gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me do this now. Yeah. That's, just, that's interesting. I mean, the way that, because I've mainly taught beginning band, like every mm-hmm. teaching position I've had has been, beginning band has been part of it. So bringing in, you know, all these like excited young brass players um, into the fold and having them start with a grade, you know, half, grade one mm-hmm. band music. And it's like, you know, block scoring and everything is, it kind of needs to be what it is, right? A limited tool set of um, range and keys and everything. But it's just awful when it's only the bass line up an octave. Or typically it might be like trombone, euphonium, bassoon, right? Mm-hmm. And like one part. Um but when it's only an octave bass line with the tubas or like maybe the same thing as um might branch out and it might be like the same as tenor sax whoa you know um if your young band has a tenor sax then it's just it's limiting with Mm -hmm. its capabilities and it's it's something that i feel like um it's probably a big issue with young really tubists too but even like euphonium players and probably trombonists um like recruitment and retainment because Mm -hmm. if you think about it a typical young band piece it's like all the you know melodic material goes to like what like flutes maybe clarinets Mm -hmm. trumpets for sure right and then it's all these like middle voices and then like the bass line is like the most leapy thing which is actually the most technically demanding of like young brass players but it's like overlooked and it's like well it's just the bass line whatever you just like you know quarter notes or maybe half notes on stuff but it's like leapy like fourths and fifths and sometimes sixth and it's like a a difficult thing but then i feel like by you know grade two three rep it starts to like some of the best pieces are like i mean the gary fagan arrangement of like amparita roca Mm -hmm. it's like look at that thank goodness that we have this awesome euphonium part in this march and there's like a grade three arrangement for it thank you you know or yeah. like maybe like you know um ball mages might throw in like a little euphonium solo in the middle of like a lyrical piece or something you know mm-hmm. to throw us a bone. Yeah. but it's like never like featured in a way that it could be even from like those younger stages which like makes me sad one of the <laughs> things that my high school band director was willing to chat about when i asked him what kind of pieces that like he wished he had had mm-hmm. when he was teaching he's like there's no like there's not a lot of good grade two music. There's not even a lot of great grade one music. And one of the things that I think is the problem, and this is a very hot take, I think <laughs> some of the current method of teaching band talks down to how smart kids actually are. Because it's easier on a music educator to teach like in unison for a good chunk of the semester. But like relegating students to like playing in B flat and E flat, I don't think is helpful. My opinion is that we should teach the chromatic scale first, because I think like 
by the end of the first week of band, most kids could probably play like for a euphonium, for instance, like B flat up to F sharp. I think that chromatic tritone or augmented fifth is like pretty reasonable. And then you, you, you've used every button. So the idea that like adding more buttons that you haven't used yet, isn't that weird? And you use accidentals on everything. And part of the reason I have this opinion is because I have an eighth grader who plays in B major every week. I just give them B major exercises that are like one line, not super complex, but have all the accidentals written in. Mm -hmm. And my my thought is, I think, because when, when you sight read a piece, I would surmise that the two things you're most likely to mess up are a repeat sign or a key change. I think that's true of most musicians, which means that like a kid missing the key is probably not a literacy problem it's a memory problem and so i think mm -hmm. if we introduce key signatures later on in the development of musicians not only can we train them to be way better because playing the chromatic scale and having notes that are outside the key isn't weird but we can then like in eighth or ninth grade say okay when we have a piece where these patterns happen a lot in order to save ink on the page they just write it at the beginning and most kids i think would say like wow that's really convenient <laughs> saves a lot of ink yeah yeah i could see that i mean i i feel like there's definitely like the the traps of being stuck in b flat e flat maybe f mm -hmm partially or maybe mostly just coming out of like method books mm -hmm. and you know this like pass it out and here we go not like anybody can be a band director but like yeah you know like you pass out essential elements or something there's like a teacher book and yeah like, okay like what's a weird note for oboes on page 16 you know and you can yeah it kind of walks you through it yeah. um so what i found was success with especially young groups and young brass players and especially low brass players is having them play tunes that they can sing yeah and ideally it would you know doesn't matter what key it's in right yeah if they know the tune and they know what buttons push down then like there yeah. you go right maybe it's just like that arnold jacobs beat into me but you know song and wind i feel like it's yeah it's well and that actually brings up a really <laughs> interesting question i think like a lot of bands could actually get far, like especially younger bands could get farther if they were playing arrangements of choral music. Mm. Out like because, beyond chorales. And, yeah. You know, 16. Because years, like, yeah. I mean, especially 6th, 7th, 8th grade choral music, like you're working with singers who are young enough that you can't use a giant range. Yeah. But like, especially as you go from like, bigger parts where you might have like a two-part choir to a three-part choir to a four-part choir yeah. there as the musicians grow they have to have less independence of parts so it's not just like uh for example like trebles and bass clef voices but then you move to soprano alto baritone voicing to soprano alto tenor bass voicing to like expanded miss voicing and if you're like a really good high school choir program you end up singing like eric whitaker music where it's 14 part splits right. and stuff like that so you can really ramp up the difficulty if you want but you could actually yeah. get into some of those like actually some eric whitaker charts could probably lay really well for young band especially if a, a piece like water night comes to line, comes to mind where it's like the rhythm is the, basically the same for everybody yeah. but the harmony is just what changes yeah yeah no that's true and i mean i feel like if it comes from a melodic place that everybody has yeah. a chance to like you know play in the sandbox with melody, exactly then like that's helpful and it's not just you know i had this this um elementary uh general music teacher in the district he's teaching he's hilarious he's a jazz percussionist and awesome awesome guy but he um would always say i like i can always tell like who played third clarinet because like they just you know they have that like demeanor and they have that like kind of like way of going about it man it's just like if we're singing like the national anthem i just expect them to like hang out and like you know the thirds and sixth like all the time like those inner voices you know <laughs> it's like you really think about that of like yeah. what's the life like of like a third clan art what's life like of a euphonium player yeah. in ensembles and like what 
like what true melodic stuff do they have to like sink their teeth into you know yeah which again i think is like the a big issue with euphonium writing typically Mm -hmm. um is that you have to wait until you get to things like asusa march or yeah you know some like awesome like emperor de roca or you know somebody that like really knows how to handle it holst yeah you know when i i got kind of a hot take about the the holst and von williams suites last year because we were playing the holst for sweden flat for dr peterson's last concert yeah and i never really appreciated how difficult it is to play that perfectly Mm -hmm. it's so difficult but the piece itself is so accessible to a younger ensemble i think a lot of people take it for granted vince kenny once told me that like if you can't play the opening bars to the whole for sweetney flat perfectly in tune in one breath at pianissimo you can't play in the marine band <laughs> and i was like really he's like yeah you know how i know it's the first round every audition they ask you that first and if you can't do it they'll just they're just say like, see you later <laughs> i was like that's that's kind of brutal but also like perfect yeah. i think that's like a really good assessment of control and lyricism and do you understand the role and i mean like because yeah. it doesn't matter if you can do everything that's possible in the euphonium if you can't be the upper octave of the tuba for a hot second like yeah yeah that's kind of like it's you know in the staff Except the C, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, that's true. That is true. And I feel like that, I mean, my high school band did that, did Holes for a Suite. We shouldn't have. We're a terrible band, really. <laughs> like, looking back on it, it wasn't like that, um, that deep of a pool. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the director wanted to do it, and we did, and it was like a experience. But I, re- I just remember thinking, like, man, yeah, like, on the page, it's not that hard. No. Really? You know, but then you put everything together and it's like, a, yeah, it could be a hot mess. But yeah. But it's so gratifying to play with a band who can play every inch of it as good as it can possibly be. Like playing yeah. that with Wind Symphony last year was yeah. like exhilarating. Yeah. Because at no point were we like, something's going to go wrong. Like it would, it would almost be hard, like by the end of the cycle, especially, it would almost be more difficult to make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so in the pocket. Yeah. I mean, yeah. especially like. It, with an ensemble that's mostly master's degree win players, we've all played it eight million times. <laughs> right. By that point. Yeah. yeah well, and, uh, last year we had a lot of people ask for it on conducting symposium. Mm. So it just like we got all these reps in and then rolled up to the concert. And yeah. Steve was like, "Wow, I feel like we just looked at this. <laughs> We're good to go." <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. I don't know. Pulse knew what he was doing. Yeah. For euphonium, for sure. Do you think the current conservatory model encourages young euphonium players to experiment enough? That is a great question. I literally just had a lesson with a student who I had taught privately when she was in high school. Um, But now she is a freshman at a conservatory, a euphonium player, and there is no wind band there so she's like carving out her own path of like you know what it's like to be a a euphonium player (laughs) and like what's the identity of that and and everything and playing in different chamber groups with odd instrumentation and you know trying to do solo stuff Mm -hmm. um but it's limited it's big time limited and it's i mean it's one thing that um played into my decision of where to go for my master's for sure was like let me go to like a band school because I want, I want to play in band. I, yeah. like, I like band, you know? Um, with like a deep studio and everything. With the, You know, it's like a, a place that euphonium players can exist. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting to think about places that have limited, like, wind band offerings and how that yeah. plays out with, like, I, mean, I don't know. You think euphonium and saxophone studios would be impacted, theoretically, but I feel like euphonium's... Yeah, I'm technically I, the most impacted by that. I mean, the, the saxophonists at least have jazz. Well, yeah, or like, you know, like there's still like a saxophone professor. Yeah, you know, as we're typically like. Yeah, well, and that's and I think that's why is because like you can't really have a big band without saxophones. I mean, you can; it just gets weird. 
the rep is a lot more limited. When people think of big band, they think saxophone. Right. So there's that kind of an outlet. Most any kind of conservatory is probably going to have trombone players already, trumpet players already, and like if we need any more evidence than Wynton Marcellus, I'm surprised. But like people have proved time over time that like playing jazz is really good for your classical playing in as much as playing classical is very good for your jazz playing because you're just a better musician. You wouldn't have to listen better. Yeah. Um, You have to silo yourself so much. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I've always thought like, okay, if we're just going to shack up in the basement and play pantomime until our fingers turn blue, like (laughs) I don't know that that's helping that much. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could like speak directly to that because I've never really... I mean, thinking true conservatory, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I haven't really had that specific experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I mean, seeing like someone who has, is in that now, it's like, man, that's mm-hmm. when euphonium options are limited. Yeah. Like, yeah, you need faculty or at least peers that yeah. are like willing to. Well, and that also happen. like almost begs a question of like, okay, so there's no band there. Like this that institution accepted a performance major for something that they're not going to, or uh, accepted yeah. that person to study whatever, but they're where they're not going to get performing experience. Right. That seems very ethically well, it's, it's questionable. Right. Because like the, the ensemble requirement is um, some sort of like chamber thing, mm-hmm. you know, which that in itself is kind of unique. You know, like if yeah. every place was like that, man, what would happen to, large ensembles i don't know yeah (laughs) well and that's the interesting thing steve talked about this at midwest this year um in his talk with the big 10 band teaching assistants and conducting assistants was that like you know a lot of people are really scared about what the future of band is but as long as it's married to music education like it's not going anywhere if anything it's probably the future and like it's great to have like chamber music is so good for your brain in terms of how much you have to do at one time but at the same point, like, it's so out of budget for schools to do regularly. Right. Because, and, and especially to, like, be coached mm-hmm. in a helpful way because that, like, multiplies the number of instructors by however many. But, yeah, yeah. I feel like, I mean, I've done some, some digging with, uh, you know, some studies on the role of the large ensemble and what that means for, you know, band specifically and, like, pre-service instrumental music education and i mean i the consensus is <laughs> for, for most that chat about this is that um really the role is to be kind of pull back the curtain and say look at check this laboratory out yeah this is a master class in uh live ensemble teaching mm-hmm. like and you don't have to be on the podium to like pick up on things right like just yeah. today in um instrumental methods class we were talking about rehearsal techniques and like you're in ensembles like you have mm-hmm. experiences to like listen to like intonation issues yeah. every single rehearsal like yeah. and and listen closely if your section's not being played with and say like okay what's the director gonna say like yeah. what what's next you know um and i feel like if anything was going to actually kill the large ensemble it would have been covid probably yeah but it's we're still here <laughs> you know? yeah, and well, craving like this social like collaborative I think if anything like uh, places where there was a hunger and a good culture it created an opportunity to make things come back stronger than ever because yeah. I think about like how tight the wind symphony culture became last year especially like where people were really making an effort like we're gonna go hang after the concerts and mm-hmm. and then we went on tour to aba and like walked around this basically desolate wasteland of a mall in indianapolis and we're like wow there's nothing to do here <laughs> <laughs> and then like all of us wound up going to the arcade and just like hanging out for a while and then like by the end of the year it was so special and then having to go through this like communal experience of like wow we have 25 people graduating and two of our band directors are retiring and but then turning around now like dr Geraldi is like really got the wind symphony playing to a level where i don't know if we know the heights we're capable of in a really good way because yeah. i mean the concert last friday was exhilarating that was awesome and like i think we're we can play even better than that i just don't think we know it yet yeah i i get that sense too like there's 
even from listening to the ensemble from like the fall i know that you know personnel has changed a little bit but yeah like the man it's like it's impressive to hear just like like there are phrases being turned Mm -hmm. on like an ensemble level and not just like individuals leading the way yeah and i think like that semester of like things are new we're not really sure how it's going to be transition was always going to be i mean it's it's, so much is new i mean like we've I have three quarters turnover in the band department. That's just a lot. It's a lot. So like, <laughs> yeah. inevi- like the fact that it's like couching in so smoothly after one semester, I'm like, wow, this is like kind of incredible. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. Uh, it, it works. I think it's really cool, and it it's fun being able to see like, well, what's happening with this, and like, how can we be a part of it, and what are we bringing in that's new, and how detailed can we be? And one of the re- one of the things I'm finding out is like listening at such a deeper level from something like improvisers exchange and taking jazz composition this semester well and also being we're kind of an oddity of a euphonium section in the wind symphony in that i don't know how many ensemble sections are 100 percent composers mm. most of the time because i spend more time writing in a week than i do playing euphonium and i know jonathan does too and so like the way we're able to th- sit down in a sectional and say like, well, there's staccato quarter notes in this section and staccato eighth notes in this section, but the patterns are the same. We need to play those like bowed staccatos and those like pizzicato. Yeah. And bringing that level of a difference into that kind of a section and how do we bring out that color of the piece? And just hmm. in showing that example, I think it elevates the, the level the ensemble is capable of. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense. I didn't realize, like, composers back there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's nuts. It's <laughs> really it's really cool. And how interesting. <laughs> and like, and then, but like that carried with like this understanding of okay, well, if euphonium is the gain boost of the wind ensemble, which it pretty much is, because you can it blends with everything basically perfectly. It's just like okay, I need louder clarinet. Well, let's pair it with euphonium, like. How, so, question for you: mm-hmm. How was your experience with the Stevenson Symphony? You just performed last week. I loved it. Um, there were a couple spots I was. Uh, the only things that really frustrated me about it were there were times where I was like, "Is this the best way you could have formatted this on a page for people to read?" But that's <laughs> it. Like, but the way the euphonium fit within. Yeah, I thought actually I thought it was really good. I mean, there's two independent euphonium parts they don't really get that separated except for parts of the first and third movements, but it, mm-hmm. in really interesting ways because the second euphonium has a counter melody that passes to the first euphonium, but they operate very independently. Um, he uses first euphonium as a lyrical soloist a lot, but then there's like, okay, euphonium is going to be the baseline and then the tubas are going to come in under it. So it's like, it's not so much that euphonium is doubling tuba, it's that tuba is doubling euphonium sometimes, but then like we pair with the saxophones a lot, and then we trade with the saxophones a lot, we double yeah. with the horns a bunch. He he just had I think Jim has a very good understanding of realizing that like if you want music that people want to play, everybody has to have a part that's interesting to some degree. And I mean, his years as an ensemble musician, I think definitely <laughs> helped him empathize yeah. in that way. Big time. And then yeah. um, a lot, uh, Jim and I, I think, have a similar creative process in that, like, there are so many, like, specific things he'll decide he wants to have as features of his pieces that he kind of paints himself into a corner, and the piece becomes like, how do I get out of this? <laughs> because you just eliminate the amount of decisions that you have to make until right. you can go in and, like, make something really yeah. interesting because all of the limits you've set right. and especially as somebody who writes as much music as he does and i'm similar in that like i tried to write really prolifically because i think that's the only way to get good like it's the easiest way to do that mm-hmm. because you don't have to spend time wondering like is this choice good enough yeah because the choice becomes like do i make a choice <laughs> right. right i have to do or this. it's like this way or that way i have to pick one of them yeah so let's go that way. And if it's bad, I can save as, go back, and then say, well, let's try the other way and see if that works. Yeah. But sometimes I like start down path A and I'm like, I like where this is going. I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. That's just interesting because I, I ne- never performed that piece, but I, mm-hmm. um, Michigan did it last year um, oh, cool. when I was doing the conducting cognate. So 
you know, Jim came and we chatted about the piece and everything. And, you know, we looked quite a bit at the score and mm-hmm. heard it live a couple of times. And it's, I just feel like, like, especially by the end mm-hmm. of that piece, it's like, yeah, that's like, that's what the euphonium can do. Yeah. Like, and right there's, there. there's some spots of that piece where it like handles a little more technically. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting, like with what we had on the program on Friday, contrasting Isaac Okotsky's uh, Poem de Feu with the Stevenson Symphony, I had to spend way more time practicing the Gutkowski because like all of the noodling, low register, double saxophone stuff, I didn't really have to spend that much time prepping moments in the Stevenson. There were a couple of spots where I'd check like, okay, is my air moving as freely as it possibly can be, especially in the solo at the end of, or at the beginning of the third movement. Yeah. And then a couple of spots where, well, and again, this just comes to, down to engraving. Um, there's a spot where he has a bunch of seven eights, then a one, uh, a couple of three fours, a, or no, seven eights, and then a one four, and then a five eight, in order to try to like fix, like stitch something together. But in my brain, the easiest way to make it happen was to do okay, like we have um, seven eight, seven eight, seven eight. This last seven eight, I'm gonna make a two four bar for the first two beats. And then a five eight bar with the last three beats and the one four bar, and then we're in the five eight. And in that sounds nuts, but in my because of the way that it's structured, the the rhythm once you hit the one or the end of the seven eight bar into the one four bar and how it's tied over is one eighth rest, a dotted quarter note, one eighth rest, and that's what goes on in the five eight bar. So in my brain, it's we're translating and quantizing from one two one two one two three one two one two one two three one two one two one two three one two one two two three four five two three four five two three four five two three four five instead of one two one two one two three one two one two one two three one two one two one two three one and one two three four five one two three four five one two three four five and so to breaking it into those slightly bigger pieces because feeling two quarter notes isn't that difficult especially when you're switching meters it gives you like just that hair second longer to go process process yeah rather than like okay let's try to calculate from this thing to that thing with this tiny little smidgen of extra by just switching where the beat is for that half second the transition is so much smoother and it's funny like when i was working with marching alina this fall all the, and it's so funny. The, everybody would talk about like, this is rushing and this is rushing and this is rushing and you're not doing this. And like the comment that I really think people just needed to hear, especially when we were playing inside was, don't try to feel every individual quarter note in cut time. You gotta feel the hypermeter. What's the bigger meter that's happening and glue your ears to the drum line. And if that happens, it will never rush. You just have to feel where the groove is. And it was really funny. Like, because I felt like people were getting so analytical about this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. It's like, it's not that deep. You just got to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Which can be hard with outdoor band. But yeah. I suppose. I, I never found it was very difficult to listen to the drum line. Because especially, especially a drum line like that. Like, <laughs> and the, the, way... the marching line I drum line is so good. I'm like, why would you listen to anybody else? <laughs> yeah. And the way it's like, Typically, the drill's mm-hmm. written. Like, it's... Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. But yeah. I don't know. I was just curious about that, especially mm-hmm. the Stevenson, because, like, it's, you know, like, idiomatic writing. And yeah. Like, like, I, you know, when he's a bar I loved player, it. so, like, it makes sense. I loved everything about like, that piece. It's fascinating. It took a second to grow on me, and then, like, once I really... I mean, there's some orchestration things in them where I'm like, is that the best decision you could have made? But, like, that's splitting hairs. I love the piece. It was really yeah. fun. I mean, it's, it's things like... I, I like, I really like um, Maslanka's music. Really, really yeah. enjoy, you know, just being like an audience member and, you know, an ensemble member. But there's there's moments like, you know, like the Fourth Symphony and it's like that horn solo beginning. Mm-hmm. Like, man. There's a killer euphonium solo in four, though. True. When the, the clarinets are playing, like the moment well, where it's like crying yeah, babies like in church. Thing. But I'm like, I always think like the beginning, like, couldn't that just be phonium solo? Just like C D E, like come on, that's yeah. like right in the range. But in horn, it's like, you know, it's not super low. Yeah, 
but it's like this when, distant when, kind of like wah, 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 yeah you know? i almost think like he wanted something that was a little more off stage it's so wacky I never got a chance to ask yeah. David about that. I, I don't know if I've told you this. So my uh, composition teacher from undergrad is a guy named Roy Magnuson. <gasps> yeah. Did I was you, at Ithaca when he was there. Oh, no way. As so, a, he was a master student. Yeah. yeah so, and he like lived with Muslanka. Yeah, he, yeah. He's like one of Muslanka's composition protégés. Yeah. So like I I went down the Muslanka rabbit hole yeah. a lot. I think I've listened to Symphony 4 almost a thousand times. <laughs> I just love it. It's everything about it is perfect in my opinion. But like uh, even the horn solo. Yeah, and like I've yeah. gotten I've gotten to sit well cuz I for me it's like it is it's the piece David wanted to write. And so like especially because it's everything is exactly the way he wanted it, I don't want to question it. Even if like there's a case to be made like oh acoustically this could be this reason whatever. Like he's particular enough that like he would have written it that way for that reason. Yeah. Um, I mean, in as much as like, did, do you know his fifth symphony at all? No. You need to check it out because the third no. movement is literally a euphonium concerto. Like he has the euphonium player come and stand at the front of the stage. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's a really cool piece. Remember, I did um, uh, in undergrad. I had the the Petersons were yeah. together, then, and then I, I took a wind literature class with Dr. Mister. And I, the end of the term, I did a, like a little presentation on a piece, and they did Miss Lanka 7, I think? Yeah. One of that euphonium solo that sounds like yeah. Blood Lists Us Up Where We Belong. Yeah, that one's and beautiful. I like spliced in the actual like Blood Lists Us Up Where We Belong like right after the solo, and Steve got very mad at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just like, he's like, shut it off, get out of here! Um, <laughs> but, I, yeah, I went down a bit of like the Miss Lanka rabbit hole then, because we did yeah. the Fourth Symphony that year i think or maybe nice. so far i think that year and um yeah it was you know one of those like who is this human what yeah like dying babies and like the, yeah. abe lincoln and like, what is happening with like this stuff <laughs> this guy yeah there's so yeah. much going on in that piece but it's, it's like just, it's, it's fascinating still, yeah and like he turns a bach chorale into free jazz yeah <laughs> <laughs> and even like, like it's like, not <laughs> heinsley's doing the hell's gate yeah it's called the saxophone trio and even just working with the students i get to to rehearse them one day um in the cycle which is super fun and talking to undergrads that are like some that have never played misaka's music i'm like oh man isn't it just fun and there's like that be, that's a yeah. weird piece but there's like sections that are like corral yeah. like it just does the band thing you know in yeah. his voice and it's like so genuine yeah and like i think people just can latch onto it in a way that's like yes like this this is i think some expressive. of Wonka's non-symphonies are super super underrated like mother earth of fanfare is like i mean it's very difficult but like if you give that to a high school band they're like let's go let's <laughs> go this is so cool because <laughs> it's like exhilarating and yeah. awesome and i mean yeah. it's a, like a big song of the earth though yeah. I think That's I think it's really funny. Steve Taylor has a really hot take about Mislanka. He thinks that he takes a million years to say anything, which I kind of like. But mm. like, like there are times where he loves a long gesture, which yeah. I appreciate. Um, but I just think it's funny <laughs> because well, you, you think about like a lot of concert fanfares are usually like what a minute to two minutes, and Mislanka's is almost four. <laughs> like Stravinsky's fanfare for a new theater, I don't even think is thirty seconds. <laughs> He's got, he's got stuff to say, you know? Yeah, he, he I, I love it. I, I can't get enough Mazlanka, personally. Yeah. But, I mean, he has, he has a lot of music, like Morning Star, An Ending Stream of Life, Traveler, Give Us This Day, that are, like, exhilarating band pieces. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, they're tough, but, like, they're short enough that you can put it on a concert. It's like, heck yeah. Yeah, you get the taste. And it's, a, it's not like this epic, like, everybody has to buy in 100% to make it. Happen. Yeah. Depending on the level of the ensemble, but, yeah. That's interesting. Hmm. Saka. Wow, well, we got there. I think that's uh, really cool. <laughs> do you have any favorite excerpts for band for euphonium? Ooh, favorite. Um, I think there's one that hot take is overrated. Whoa. Yeah, Takata Martial. <laughs> <laughs> I love Takata Martial. I know. Like as an excerpt, it's like it's okay, you know. Yeah. But like as an actual, like in context of a band piece i'm like i don't know like is it that really 
The thing I like um, about Takata Martial is if I give a, a student Takata Martial, I get every I figure out almost everything they can do in a second. That's true. Like yeah, I can see that. I think it's really good for assessment, even though I'm not the biggest fan of that piece. I feel like favorite excerpt to play is like it's tough when you you know you try to make like an excerpt like its own musical moment, but I feel like um, the times I've been able to play Colonial Song. Oh yeah. Is like, that's just like fulfilling, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and it's like soloistic enough in in context that, you know, as an excerpt, it's like, yeah, that's mm. that's how it goes, you know. You oh don't yeah. Need a lot of imagination elsewhere. Um, it's gotta feel way different to play with a band though than like. I mean, just yeah. playing in isolation. I, if nothing else, then like having some people around you, like deadens and set enough of the vibrations that you don't have to play like true pianissimo like, like you do when like you're like by yourself in a room yeah <laughs> that's why i find yeah. colonial song to be so tough to ask for in auditions because like yeah you want to know somebody can play it but like the physics and the ergonomics of what you can do and what you can get away with especially like if you're in an ensemble in a sympathetic hall playing something like that yeah like it it's not the same beast and there's like give and take with like the it's a duet so yeah like, at least like that part where i forget what measure it is like picks up a little bit you know yeah like that fun part yeah i know what you mean um i don't know i feel like cowboys yeah cowboys super fun, fun especially when it's like okay play both parts which it's kind of easier instead of like dug it up dug it up yeah um yeah i feel like also there was a oh man i can't remember the name of it some mendelssohn fingles cave i think it was yeah hibbert's yeah. overture fingles cave yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. a lot yeah that one's so fun super fun and the the fun thing i always find ironic about that piece is i don't think people play it geometrically enough right which is kind of a hot take the why do you think it needs to be more geometric i have a very particular reason why i find fingles cave needs to be geometric I mean, I feel like the role it plays mm -hmm. within, I mean, transcription, but like within like your orchestration, um, it's not like it, you look at it on the page, it's like, oh yeah, this is like, I'm going to youth it up and like, why yeah. not grease up the tater cuff and like, yeah. you know, get the elbow going like, doo -doo -doo -doo. like I, it's not, it I needs find, to stay like. I find that it establishes a groove, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, you should look at photos of Fengel's Cave. I've been to Fengel's Cave. It's sick. It's one of the coolest places ever. It's in this remote island uh, near Iona in the North Hebrides in Scotland. And uh, Fengel's Cave is, uh, or the Giant's Causeway, as the locals call it, is the place where the giant Fengel would enter the underworld to return to his lair. And Fengel's Cave is where the entrance to this portal is. And there's another one off the coast of Ireland. But... The sea has weathered the rocks at Fengel's Cave to be almost perfectly hexagonal. It's incredible. But so I look, I look at that and I, I think like, okay, I think, I think Mendelssohn is trying to set up like a very strict groove, and I think you need to play it that way. Yeah, with like very little. Yeah, like once that sixteenth is like set, you gotta stay. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Kind of wacky. I should like tour the country giving like master classes on <laughs> Fingal's Cave specifically. <laughs> I, this is the part where I tell you I try to go that deep on like everything. Whether it's like I'm just prepping an excerpt or it's like the music that I'm writing. Something I picked up from, uh, are you familiar with the trombonist Jeremy Wilson? He used to play in Vienna Phil for a long time and now he teaches at Vanderbilt University. Oh, okay. He's somebody you should look up. Jeremy's a genius. He's so cool. He's such a great teacher. But part of his philosophy is like if you want authentic performed performances of stuff, you need to go that deep. Mm. Yeah, I mean it makes sense. Yeah, it's really kind of cool and yeah. really special. I, I mean it's a it's a long process, totally worth it. I did not go that deep on Fingal's Cave. I remember the name. <laughs> well, I mean I, I had like, I, just remember that I had the I had it's the like... benefit of having been to Fingal's Cave like when I went to Scotland with my parents. Uh, when I was a senior in high school because we, we didn't have a lot of time to go on vacation very much when I was in high school and they were like oh this would be really cool if we had like one like serious family vacation so they took my sister and I to Scotland 
and we toured all over the countryside. We stayed in this like little cottage in like this remote village and like went all over the place and went hiking and went to castles and stuff. It was so cool. That's awesome. Um, but we took the ferry out to Staffa and Iona and saw some of the islands in the North Hebrides. And they talked about like, oh yeah, Mendelssohn came here and he wrote all this music about this. <laughs> and it wasn't until like I came to music school, got that excerpt in like an audition packet where I was like, oh, this is what the, those guys were talking about. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna go get a refresher about this. Yeah. <laughs> and I went and I looked at some photos and I like tried to really remember what was going on and I like thought about it a lot and then I was like, okay, I'm, I think this is how I need to prep this. You didn't take a trip to Scotland just because you got the excerpt. No, <laughs> though I suppose like I mean, with the advent of Google Earth, that's something you well, could do. That's true. That's true. You could go zoom around a little bit. You can go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Captured it all, seemingly. Yeah, or I mean, even just going and like trying to find an artist who's like taken photos or painted it. Yeah, I think all I, I'm really into is interdisciplinary art, so I'm all about that kind of stuff, and that's probably part of why I've like taken up this banner of like euphoniums need to do more and experiment more and yeah. be more interdisciplinary in the art form, because I think that's really the only way to like get other parts of. The majority of the music school to take us very seriously which is frustrating yeah no that's true i mean it's it's a legit instrument even though it's you know just because it's not as uh you know been been written for prolifically as the rest of like orchestral brass yeah it's like man it can do so much yeah and goodness gracious and especially like looking you know to the future Obviously, there's you know, wind bands. I think will will stick around. I hope <laughs> for um, foreseeable future. But then, yeah, like any opportunity that composers, performers get to like collaborate with others and just get in different sound worlds and yeah. go nuts, you know, and and just create these like soundscapes or combinations of you know what's what's possible orchestrationally the better like it's such a Definitely. it's it can do so much and i don't know hasn't been fully tapped yet i agree uh, where would you like to see the euphonium go over the next 20 or 25 years mm, i think a lot more in like less of a distinct like silo of chamber music of like brass quintet and like tuba euphonium quartet you know, but just like having, not just like brass ensembles, but having it be like, yeah. having composers write for like, you know, like brass fanfares or brass, whatever, and not just have it be orchestral brass. Have yeah. it be like truly like a euphonium as like an integrated part mm -hmm. as like whatever you'd write for low horn, but like make it more like yeah. deep. <laughs> yeah, know? I'm, I'm as very much in the idea that I think more, especially like, performing musicians performance majors at universities need to be like making ragtag chamber groups and having call for score opportunities yeah because like i, I think it's such an untapped market and you can make like really wacky instrumentation do you know yeah. the load bang ensemble they're based in new york oh yeah um yeah. so the load bang ensemble i think is a really great example of this because their instrumentation is trumpet trombone bass clarinet and baritone voice which is just like such an odd set of instruments to write for yeah. but when you when they have a call for scores or if they're coming and they're playing and doing a residency at the university where you're at or whatever they usually will drop like a one sheet of like here's what's best for our ensemble in mm -hmm. terms of like how to score for us so the piece works like if you just check these boxes that we're going to give you the piece will work about 80 percent of the time yeah which is i think real or at least has an 80 percent chance of working which i think is a really really good place to start yeah. and so i think a lot of people would go in for a call for scores if it was like it's ten dollars to enter and you get like a, a recording, a premiere, and 200 bucks if you win. Right. Because there's enough, like, small-level composers, people like me, my friend Jonathan, composers just studying at University of Illinois, who, like, $10 to enter a competition isn't a lot. But, like, us getting an extra 200 that's like, oh, that's, like, cool. Yeah. And then you can do honorable mentions or just, like, oh, we're going to play 
a, a recital for the next year when we do our tours and it's going to be just the featured list of compositions yeah. that won the competition and then by having um like the entry fee for the competition uh you you get a little bit of funding to do some more stuff with right. especially if you're a 501c3 organization yeah. you can register those as donations and then like you don't have to pay taxes on them right. and then that becomes funding to like help the tour get started I mean, I feel and like, like if, if you have a ragtag instrumentation like euphonium e-flat clarinet uh sitar and glockenspiel like yeah you're going to have so much wild music coming out of that but you've institutionalized euphonium as in like an odd chamber ensemble right i and i feel like looking even at like you know falcone um audition competition things like there's so much yeah there's so many things like in the specific composition like i tech mm-hmm. of like i guess that's where i was looking actually i was looking at both yeah it's really i tech um with like you know mock whatever whatever auditions but there's a whole like composition side too yeah which is awesome you yeah know, it's like solo like it's like free to enter it's like solo euphonium i think with a yeah. brass band like yeah like more things yeah. like that that like you know crowdsourcing what's possible yeah i i think we're remiss in not having like an experimental ensemble division that features stupid euphonium on that because right. we've recently added two more euphonium and fixed media and i think that's going mm-hmm. to go a long way in terms of expanding like what euphonium is capable of yeah. uh, i like a lot of what benjamin dean taylor is writing right now mm. um he's the guy that wrote flow yeah uh, which was the falcone p- test piece for last year I think that's great. I think soloists with brass band, soloists with wind band are cool avenues, but there's a lot of those. There's got to be a lot. It, it, it gets there, like, there's a lot of that already. It gets campy. Yes. You know? It's like its own like little universe. Yeah, I mean, like uh, Hiram and uh, Gail Robertson and I all have talked about how like the like Spark, Pantomime, and Harlequin are just like the Bocalari, but a little different. Similar, yeah. I mean, they, there's a slow section and a fast section, mm-hmm. and in pantomime and the Bocalari, part of the fast section is in ten eight. So it's like, right. that's like yeah. really sinking your teeth into like what's, what's normal or normalizing that side of stuff. Right. So, yeah, I think really trying to stretch the idea of like what euphonium is supposed to sound like and the music that we're supposed to play is like yeah. really important to seeing how things evolve. Yes, absolutely, in different combinations stretch yeah. it all the colors cool exactly um you have been out at 3 30 we've gone a little past that so. oh yeah i gotta go um <laughs> thanks for being on the show of course um thank you do you want people to follow you on social media nah it's okay okay cool <laughs> <laughs> thanks mike you got it we hope you've enjoyed this episode of the musical trick artista the podcast you can find us online at mcgowanmusic.com or listen on your favorite podcast platform you can also visit us at andrew mcgowan on youtube or music mcgowan on instagram